Thank you for joining us on the Catholic Gentleman Podcast, where we discuss what it means to be a man who lives with virtue and how to actually grow in holiness in today's world. How do you find happiness in life, and what is the good life? As the church has taught and all the doctors of the church have discussed, it is in growing in the virtues. But what are the virtues, and how do we find them and actually grow in them? In fact, how many virtues are there? So perfect for our show today, our guest comes from a Benedictine monastery in Australia to discuss St. Albert the Great and 42 virtues he identified and how easy they are for us to understand and practice to live a great life. So stay with us. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us on another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are so blessed that you are here. We are your hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. If you've been listening to us frequently, welcome. Thank you so very much for joining us on another episode. If this is your first time, we are grateful that you're here. Please click that subscribe button so that you can get these each and every week as we dive into topics of virtues, as we dive into topics of striving for holiness, specifically for men. Um, Although we've got a lot of women listeners, and we're grateful that you're here as well. Uh, If you are looking for a way to support the Catholic gentleman, or if you're looking to go deeper into a more systematic approach to understanding the faith as it relates to masculinity and growing holiness, I encourage you to head over to Catholic Gentleman Plus, where we go through a different theme every month, but they're all based on three categories, self-mastery, the spiritual life, and our relationships with others. Uh, This month, actually, we're discussing the rule of life, and we're actually giving away a free one-month planner rule of life to help you have a practical guide in that rule of life. And providentially so, we are joined by a Benedictine today, uh, Father Robert Nixon, and we couldn't be more blessed that he is here. We're going to be talking about virtues, but how perfect that we have a Benedictine uh, joining us on the first podcast episode of the month of October, where we in Catholic Gentleman Plus, we are talking about uh, rule of life. So who is Father Robert Nixon? I want to talk a little bit about him. So he lives over there in Australia. He's got multiple degrees. Hopefully we'll get to talk about some of those. Um, He's on a mission to bring uh, the wise words of, of many different saints to our lives here in the English-speaking world, and we're so grateful for that. He lives in the Benedictine community of New Norcia, and he was, um, he entered in in 2013, and he was ordained in 2017. He has studied composition, musicology, philosophy, literature, and education, and uh, he worked after working for a period as a professional musician and educator. He decided to enter into the seminary there in Queensland. So, Father, that is quite the story that I just was able to introduce our listeners to. How are you doing today? Wonderful, John. It's uh, fantastic to be with you and to have the opportunity of sharing with you and all of your listeners today. Yeah, thank you. So, Father, I was actually a uh, professional musician myself. That's why I got that trumpet over there. I have two degrees in music. What type of musician were you? And from being a musician, what led you into the monastery? I would love to hear this. So, John, my my main instrument is the piano. And uh, from that, I play also harpsichord and and pipe organ and um, to a lesser extent, guitar and other instruments. But what led me uh, to that and to my life in religion, I guess, was um, a seeking after the spiritual, a seeking after the higher and ultimate realities. You know, and I believe this is actually something which is very common amongst musicians, um, because ultimately, what's the purpose of music except to bring us into contact with these more important realities? I always had, since I was a child, a sense that I would go into the service of the church. Um, But first I had also this other love, this passion for music that somehow I needed to express to to get out of my system, um, to offer for the glory of God, which I did um, for, for quite a number of years. And then after that, the call to the service of the church was powerfully reawakened in me. And I reached my 33rd year of age. And I reflected that that was as long as our Lord lived on earth. 
Um, I felt that I'd done everything that I was called to do as a musician and as a teacher. And I thought, well, the next step is to enter the church, which, um, which I did. But my first step wasn't to enter a Benedictine monastery because I'd never actually been to a Benedictine monastery. I didn't know any monks personally, but I knew a lot of diocesan priests and I knew the great work they did and the need that existed for them. So I went to the diocesan seminary and studied there. Um, now, when I reached the end of my studies, I began to realize that I actually loved the seminary life, um, which, which probably isn't a common experience for that many seminarians, but living in community, study. Um, so I felt maybe maybe I'm called, in fact, to a religious community. And I took a retreat here at New Norcia, which is the oldest religious community in Australia. And I was, I was blown away by it. I was terribly impressed, and I felt a great call to join which I did, um, but I had it was a difficult decision to leave my home diocese to join the Benedictine monastery, but one which I certainly don't regret. Wow. No, I think that's beautiful. And actually, uh, to some extent, um, when I started having children as a professional musician, um, I kind of realized this is something similar. It was like I had accomplished uh, what I was set out to do as a professional trumpet player, having toured over the world and and God was calling me to something more. And here I am on the Catholic gentleman with uh, an incredible family and uh, a job that's able to support them. So thanks be to God, Father. I appreciate that story. Yeah, and I, uh, that's you're, as you became a Benedictine, you know, there's a lot of um, emphasis on, you know, prayer and work, but also study. Um, and I would love to hear how you, were drawn deeper into these various paths of education that you pursued and ultimately how you just discovered a love for St. Albert's grave and some of these other figures that are important in your spiritual life. Um, uh, so, so you entered the Benedictines and then, then what came next, I guess? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, the love of study is part of the Benedictine uh, charism. And throughout the whole Middle Ages, Benedictine monasteries were, were, were the centres of learning um, for the whole of Europe, that they were the places where books were copied and collected and read and so forth. And that was something I felt a very deep affinity for. Um, I had kind of had a, a, an academic background, um, but I, I realised that I wanted, you know, I came to the monastery and I saw our library which is over 80,000 books, many of them centuries old. And um, something about it just drew me in that I knew that um, the Benedictines play such an important role um, in the background of the church in keeping this learning alive. And so I, I believe that God has given us um, what makes human beings unique amongst his creatures is that he's given us this soul this rational intellect. And it's one of the ways in which human beings reflect the glory of God. So for this reason, I believe, uh, Sam, that it behooves us to study, you know, and it's something which I really love, um, especially studying the older writings, the things which haven't been translated into English yet, because it opens up a whole new world. Yeah, it sure does. And what a blessing it is for us, because we don't have the ability to translate these things. Um, I Very few of our listeners could uh, pick something up written in Latin or in German or Italian and and uh, and read it. So uh, what a blessing. Well, let's switch to just ch chatting about virtue in general. I think this is great. Why is this so important for men? We talk about virtues all the time, and St. Albert the Great does such a phenomenal job, and I'm so blessed that we were able Indeed. to get this uh, this book. So what is it about virtues that we as men should start for our base foundations to grow in holiness? So, you know, I think it's very important to understand exactly what virtue is and what it means. And sometimes when we say a person is virtuous, we might 
just think, oh, they never break any rules. They always yeah. do things by the book and so forth. But in fact, that's not what virtue means. Fundamentally, the word virtue is related to the Latin word via, which means man, mm. um, and also another Latin word um, which means strength, vis or vim. Yes. And so virtues are literally strengths in character. They are what enable us to fulfill God's will for us. Mm. And they also are what enable us to um, fulfill our, our own life destiny, to be happy, strong uh, human beings. Of course, women have virtues as well, but the word virtue literally means to do with masculinity, that it's that it's this thing of strength. And the, the opposite of virtue, vice, um, literally means a weakness. If we say something is vitiated, it means it's weakened. So we need to cultivate these virtues because we need, you know, life is in its way uh, um, a battle for most people. We need to be strong to face the challenges, to fulfill our responsibilities. And I think one of the things which is particular to the vocation of being a man, whether you're a father and husband or whether you're a priest and monk, is that we need to offer this strength uh, to humanity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so important because um, we don't ask these questions anymore, right? What is a virtue is something that has been asked for centuries and from um, Aristotle, obviously, somebody who influenced uh, St. Albert the Great, and of course, Thomas Aquinas, who was influenced by both Aristotle and St. Albert the Great. Uh, but we just don't ask these things. Or if we do ask them, like you just suggested, we're like, oh, I'm a good person. And we just kind of limit it to that without any sort of systematic approach to what those virtues are and to how to grow in those virtues to live the good life or to um, submit our will to God's will for that, that, and, and how that looks. And indeed, I think. Indeed, indeed. And, and, you know, one thing which we sometimes overlook with what the virtues are is we think it, it's just about following rules, keeping rules and everything, our particular religious rules. But in fact, the virtues were highly esteemed um, by the ancient Greeks, by the ancient Romans, by virtually every character. And while there's little differences, um, what I think is more amazing than the differences is the substantial agreement on what makes a virtuous person. So what Aristotle said is not so different from what Albert the Great said, what um, Thomas Aquinas said, and so forth. There is a common a concept of what a virtuous person, what a virtuous man should be like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear too about some of these medieval figures that have kind of captured your mind and heart. Um, because we we often focus on a few prominent names like uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Obviously everyone knows who he was and his, his great contributions to theology and yet he's just one of you know dozens and dozens of great minds that were uh around at that time and, and obviously saint albert the great uh was saint thomas's teacher and yet very few people know about saint albert compared to saint thomas uh even though he was yeah. one of the most famous individuals of his day for his great great learning um and his not just learning but yeah. sanctity as well so tell us about saint albert a little bit what was his background uh if you would and um how did you discover this little gem of a book that you you ended up translating yeah uh, so so saint albert the great uh was was born in germany um in about 1200 and he felt at a young age a call to religious life, to enter the church in some way. And he had a vision of the Blessed Virgin who told him to enter the order of preachers, the uh, Dominicans. And at that time, they were quite a new thing. So, you know, um, probably he hadn't really even thought very much about the Dominicans. But it was this call to enter, to, to, to enter on this um, life. And 
he was blessed with uh, phenomenal intelligence. He was regarded as the most learned man of his time. And this is not only in uh, theology and sacred scripture and philosophy, but in, in science, in natural science, biology, geology, um, in so many different areas. And he actually wrote very extensively on all of these areas. Um, his collected writings are bigger in length than the collected writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. And I think a lot of people don't, don't realize that and also don't realize the great um, awe he was held in during his lifetime. Um, so we've been, the world has been a little bit slow to translate his work into English. One of the reasons for this is the sheer length of it, the sheer quantity, um, and also the fact that some of his writing on, on science and so forth, people would probably see, well, you know, this is medieval things which aren't really, we don't really believe anymore. That's true. But I, I find them personally remarkably interesting. And so I was very impressed by this particular book. It's one of his shorter books on the virtues. And one of the things which drew my attention to it was this work was widely circulated um, in Latin editions uh, right through until the 19th century. So one of his greatest works, and I think one of his most accessible as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think that's that's um, such uh, just so good for us to have in our hands, because for men who don't know, and we're going to talk more about the book, but it is simply 42 virtues to reach heaven. And I guarantee you, I could not have named 42 virtues until I got this book. And uh, mm -hmm. and so and it it's set up in such a way that makes so much sense. One thing that I really appreciate about St. Albert is not only how he cautions you about some false virtues or some vices that appear as virtues but he's getting he gets very specific about those vices and how certain vices can appear as virtues and as we as men i really appreciate the ability to 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 dive in and to dissect and to reflect on it so I guess, turning there, what was your first experience when you were seeing that there were 42 virtues uh, to work on and, and how did that captivate your yeah. attention? So so I was, I was uh, like you, quite amazed that there were 42, which he came up with. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure if I tried to write a list of the virtues off the top of my head, it would be nothing like 42. <laughs> The other um, thing which really impressed me about this book was I mentioned before that he was he was also a scientist as well as a, a theologian, and that he kind of applies the scientific approach to human behavior. And um, he's obviously was very experienced as a spiritual director and teacher, and he was able to pick up these sides of when something is a true virtue or when it's a kind of defective, or when it's a fake virtue, when it's even a vice posing as a virtue. And I think that's so helpful. Because sometimes within our own selves, we might think something is a good point, a strong pointed character. You know, we might think where well, I'm sticking to my principles here, when in reality, all I'm doing is being stubborn. Um, or, or we might think, you know, I'm, I'm being very humble. Then we might think, well, I'm actually letting people know that I'm being humble. <laughs> so, so Albert uh, Saint Albert was able to pick up and identify all of those things. So, this book see, serves as a very useful tool for looking at one's own self, for working out where uh, where you are, and you know um, where you might be going a little bit wrong to to get back on the right path. That's right, and to not uh, get the wrong impression. Um, he also goes into things like constancy and perseverance and fortitude and what those mean, um, you know, not just stubbornness and, you know, um, Im immobility or, or things of that nature that can that can present yeah. themselves. And so he does so in such a way that is, I find, um, incredibly balanced and at the same time just infused with this love of God, right, with this 
this higher purpose, not living an idle life, but one that's that's worth pursuing and worth diving into these things on a daily basis, uh, even so far as the end of it, where he starts praying uh, for anybody who can just grab hold of one of these virtues and excel in it. He's going to excel in all the virtues. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, but- it's just so... Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the most interesting points. The idea is that if you get just one virtue perfect, then all of the others will flow into place as a result of that. Yeah, and uh, as we said, this is a, a, a larger number of virtues that he outlined here. I love how the uh, medieval scholars were uh, excellent at just splicing everything into these uh, very fine nuances and everything, but but as you were working on this work, did you discover any new virtues uh, that really jumped out at you? And you were thinking to yourself, like, "Wow, I had never considered that before." Or, I really appreciate him highlighting this virtue. Or, like, is there any that that were kind of your favorite <laughs> as you were working on this work? Yeah. Um, so, so one which I really liked was the virtue of liberty. Um, which he talks about, and he defines really what liberty is. And for him, liberty is a freedom uh, of self-determination, which comes from a freedom from um, from vices, from the control of the flesh, from control of the lower self. Um, these things which sometimes people imagine make them free, but in reality make them slaves. And so he presents this very well, that the true freedom is our, our freedom uh, to, 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 to make our own choices in the light of God, um, rather than being dragged down by, by the numerous things in the external world and in the internal world, which tend to confine us and impair our freedom. Yeah, absolutely. And when I read that uh, Liberty, I pointed out as one of mine as well that I thought was so unique. And my mind immediately went to St. Maximilian Kolbe, and then, of course, Edith Stein, and then uh, St. Thomas More, and these individuals that really displayed authentic liberty, right? And Thomas More, obviously, you would think of as more of a patriotic or, you know, um, national liberty, but that's not at all what uh, what the virtue of liberty uh, is as he brings it up. And sure enough, you've got Thomas More who displayed an authentic virtue of liberty in, in droves, um, you know, in his, in his martyrdom yeah. and how he acted. Yeah, yeah. And for Benedictines, this is so important because in some ways we seem to live a very um, strictly governed life and so forth. But the whole idea of this is to cultivate um, spiritual liberty. You know, and we find even a liberty in in the virtue of obedience, paradoxically, as that might seem. Yeah, so um, St. Albert uh outlines these these virtues too but um you mentioned he brings kind of a scientific approach to that, and i yeah, would love to hear you expand a little bit on that like what what how did he yeah bring his great mind for science into this work uh, okay so um you know i think a, a very good example of this is where he talks about spiritual joy and holy sadness and they're both virtues and um, for us today, of course, um, in the Middle Ages, you know, they had this notion that there was a kind of holy sadness, a compunction, a sorrow for sins, um, a, 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 a kind of sharing in the passion of, of, of Christ in a way um, that was regarded as, as a great sign of holiness. Today, I think we, we struggle with it because we think, well, you know, it's this person is, is sad or depressed or whatever. But he manages to put both the um, spiritual joy and the holy sadness to distinguish when they're the, the right kind and when they're the wrong kind. You know, and he says of this holy sadness that if it comes from a sense of sin, um, a sense of um, sharing in the sufferings of Christ and in our fellow human beings, then it's holy sadness. But if it comes from some particular thing we feel we've been deprived of, then it's not holy sadness. It's just, you know, 
regular sadness of the of the garden variety that's not a virtue and um so i think this is this is a, a very important thing yeah absolutely well and if you could share in along this thought process about how he opens with love or charity which is the pinnacle of virtues as we understand from scripture and it's brought out by saint francis de sales and all these others but then he quickly goes he doesn't go through the um uh the theological virtues then he jumps to humility right which as augustine called it the yeah. foundation of all virtues so it, it was there uh did you find in your in your research and in your translation um that that just did he directly speak on that or was that just something that that he uh, appealed to as um as he understood the the necessary uh, you know priority of these yeah. virtues yeah yeah so so love is the virtue which comes first of all and he distinguishes this into different forms of love love of god and love of one's neighbor and um this love of god is so fundamental and um why is it the, the most basic virtue we think about what god actually is god is the perfection of all goodness so the love of God is actually the exact same thing as the desire, the aspiration to goodness. And that has to be there as, as the foundation. In fact, in a way, everyone by definition desires goodness, but it's just sometimes there's a lack of clarity about what this true goodness is. And of course, we know that the ultimate goodness, the perfect goodness is in God alone. And what he writes about love of neighbor is very illuminating as well. So he 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 explains that yes, we love everyone as we love ourselves. We desire um, their salvation. We desire also their happiness. But we don't necessarily love them with the same degree of intensity, um, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. A, a family person loves his 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 wife and children in a particular way um more so than a complete stranger who he you know has nothing to do with the, the love is still the same but it's of a different degree and then humility naturally follows this because humility implies an openness an openness to improve to correct ourselves and nothing closes the door on personal self improvement on growth in the virtues like pride because pride is basically the conviction that you know i'm already where i should be i'm already um the exemplar that other people should be looking to um so humility is the opposite approach you know it's it it allows this openness and humility is a kind of seeing oneself through the eyes of truth and through the eyes of god mm. Yes, yeah, wonderful. And uh, thinking about these virtues, though, when we bring it down to daily life, like let's say we pick a pick a virtue that we want to strive to practice from this work. I don't know, generosity or something. Um, yeah, some virtues are more conducive to putting into practice in daily life. So if I want to practice the virtue of generosity, I can look for ways to give of my time, of my material resources, of things like. But when you take one that's a little more uh, difficult to, let's say, make an act of the will for. So, for example, yeah. like you mentioned earlier, spiritual joy. Like, you know, it's, if you're having a, a difficult day, you just got a flat tire on the way to work and, you know, you're late yeah. for an important meeting and you have a big bill that just came out. Like, it's hard to just will yourself into joy in that moment. So... So my yeah. question is, like, is. are some of these virtues ones that um, arise spontaneously yeah. on the spiritual path, or are, are all of these virtues designed to be practiced in the sense of um, I'm going to choose to act in this way until it becomes a habit yeah. and eventually a virtue, or yeah. do some of them just kind of arise spontaneously? That, that, that's actually a very good point. And um, I think it, he puts deliberately – 
the spiritual joy and uh, holy sadness next to each other. Because some people in some situations might find themselves with a propensity towards one than the other. And um, there are so many that are like that. So, for example, there's um, solitude, um, silence. Not everyone can really cultivate those to a big extent, depending upon their situation in life. Um, so they might be, instead of practicing um, silence to any great extent, they might be practicing zeal for souls because they they might be preaching the gospel and so forth. So um, I think the point is that we don't need to aim to have every single one of these 42 virtues, you know, um, and, and that, in fact, was part of our the choice of the subtitle with um, with ten books, and um, originally they said the forty two virtues you need to reach heaven. I thought, no, that's not quite what he's saying. He's saying these forty two virtues will enable you to reach heaven, but you don't necessarily have to have each of the forty two to the highest degree um, at all times. And this is a point he makes at the end that any one of the virtues um carried right through will will bring us to salvation so i think it's a good approach to to focus on particular virtues which you possess and to work at at cultivating those most strongly on the other hand if there's a virtue which you feel you don't have at all you know you look at um then it, it it might be a good idea to see well can i can i develop this in me but if you can't um it's not like god is going to have a, a checklist of these 42 virtues that you need to get into heaven um you know because these the the per, the purpose of the virtues is for us to fulfill what god is calling us to at any particular time and some people in certain situations of their life may find themselves drawn into silence, contemplation. Other people may find themselves at other times proclaiming the gospel or being very industrious in works of charity and so forth. And, for example, monks, we, uh, I mean, we do, we do works of charity, but certainly not to the same extent that some other religious orders do, where it's their primary vocation, the apostolic orders. Um, so we concentrate on our thing. So I think it's it's quite right for people to concentrate on what they feel their own um, particular thing is, because not 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 excluding all the others, but you know, um, it's a little bit like if you play a sport. Any sport will get you fit, but it doesn't follow from that that you have to play every single sport. Mm. Um, so I think it makes sense to specialize in whatever you're called to, and also what suits your situation in life at any particular time. And I think this will change for people from when they're young to when they're middle aged to when they're old. I think a lot of people during their middle ages of life, constancy and perseverance become the big thing. Because, you know, life can be quite a long journey and, and that's when our faith and commitment can be so important. Um, for a lot of younger people, it might be zeal and works of charity. For older people, it might be increasingly um, hope and prayer and contemplation. Yeah, I, I really like how you're breaking up seasons of life and how they bring out certain virtues or they require certain virtues uh, for an individual. I want to, for, I guess, my my last question, I kind of want to um, take that a little bit further and say that St. Albert talks about there are some virtues which occur naturally to an individual by temperament or by um, disposition. Yeah. And, um, and so if you were a guy... Um, if you were counseling somebody, and I know that there's no um, direct rule, but would you encourage them to go through and read all these? Would you encourage them to start with those that naturally occur to their temperament to better understand them? Or would you encourage them to yeah. go towards that they they don't understand and ones that they might be lacking to work on? And if so, how to approach the growth in that virtue, which I know St. Albert and just um, 
uh, to bring out a little bit more. He does. He does such a phenomenal job of laying it out, showing in scripture or um, or other saints how they either had this virtue or they did not have this virtue, the rewards of having this virtue, and then some missteps or some obstacles to look out for. So I think it's really wonderful, all in like three to four pages per virtue. But how would you counsel somebody to to get started um, with a work such as this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think in in these cases, he points out that we have net virtues which come to us quite naturally. And he says that if we don't actually uh, develop them or go beyond what comes to us naturally, then there's actually no, no merit in it. So, um, for example, if we're naturally a, a tidy person and so we just do our thing and we're tidy, yeah, that's okay. But if a person struggles with tidiness, then they're actually making an effort so that they're they're participating in the struggle of of Christ and also improving themselves, you know. Um, so I think a good approach to reading this book would be um would be actually to read it um straight through in the order in which it presents them. It's um I mean, it's not an overly long book. Um and then to return to the ones, to tick off the ones which um, either strike your heart in a particular way or which you find a little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get to a particular virtue, um, say you get to generosity, and then you think, well, gee, I, I don't do any of those <laughs> things, or prudence or justice, then maybe that's a sign from God that that's what you need to. To visit, so so you know we both build on our strengths, but at the same time address our weaknesses, and and this is how we can, you know, uh, prepare ourselves for the many challenges of life by arming ourselves with these virtues. Amen. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great point because there there are things like at least specifically even among um men and women that come more naturally right like men tend to be more more action oriented and, and outwardly focused and goal directed and things like that uh but sometimes men need to learn to listen more effectively or understand more effectively uh and um uh just develop that side of themselves that doesn't come as easily so I love this idea of being well-rounded, like you're saying, of like um, enhancing those virtues you already have, but also developing ones that come more, more yeah. uh, challenging he, for you. He, he, indeed, you know, and one of the things he points out uh, at the beginning when he's talking about the relationship between vices and virtues, if something uh, within our character stands out to a massive degree, um, then we need to ask ourselves if we're taking it too far. And this is kind of an Aristotelian idea uh, mm -hmm. that any characteristic, if taken too far, ceases to become a virtue and, in fact, can become a vice. Um, so this is a process of moderating uh, our, ourself at times, you know, and um, I think there's a lot of cases of that. You know, if, we, if we're if we ready to correct other people, you know, you could say, well, that's kind of a good thing. You're helping people out. You're guiding them and everything. But if it's a obvious characteristic of your personality that you're always correcting other people, then perhaps you're taking it a little bit too far. The same with, um, the same with everything, you know. Um, even generosity, um, you know, we're called to give and everything, but he says this has to be done in in a prudent type of way with regard to our other responsibilities and so forth, so that we have to, um, you know, we have to moderate everything. And moderation is such an important key uh, in in life. If we find anything which is going to extremes within ourself, um, then we should think, well, am I taking it too far? And in particular, a good sign that we might be taking something too far or to an extreme is if a, a bunch of other people comment on it and notice it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it reminds me of like you, you're both you're both musicians, right? Like, but it reminds me of like music, right? Where if any note or tone is like dominating or dissonant with the rest, uh, it's not a pleasant piece of music, you know. And it's like they all have to be in harmony and balance and uh and and kind of that uh, musical scale and um it's kind of the same with the soul where it's like if, there, if there's anything that's too extreme or too too uh far in one direction even a good thing mm. can really uh, yeah. kind of create this inner dissonance um so my my last question is uh, saint albert a brilliant mind kind of uh, unfortunately overlooked many times uh as as people kind of look back to church history um so are you working on any other works translating any other works uh do you have any other uh kind of lesser known saints that you're trying to bring to light uh as part of your vocation yeah. to um bring these things uh, to, uh to, to modern readers? absolutely absolutely so i'm i'm working on the visions of christ of a saint uh, called veronica of milan mm. who lived in the 1400s which i think is a very going to be a very interesting work uh, indeed and um so i've also got coming out quite soon the visions of saint francis of rome who was a benedictine oblate and she had uh, visions in which an archangel led her down through hell, through purgatory, and then up to heaven. So um, this is a quite fascinating work, which I think will be very interesting to many people when it comes out in the near future. Wow, thanks be to God. Well, Father, where can uh, any final words of encouragement and where can men go uh, to pick up this great book and other ones that you are working on? Yeah, I would uh, encourage people to read this particular book, The Paradise of the Soul, 42 Virtues uh, to Reach Heaven, because it, I think it's something which will be a lifelong treasure, a very valuable guide, and a real work of spiritual and personal self-improvement for anyone who reads it. Um, so to, to obtain any of these books, if you go to the TAN book website, would be my suggestion, 10books.com, uh, 10 or you could just Google it, and, and you'll be able to uh, find where you can obtain these wonderful works. Wonderful. Well, and I'll put all those links in the show notes for any of our listeners. And so, uh, Father, what a blessing. It's It's been really great. I, I'd love to talk more about your life as a musician and and some of these other works, and so we'll have to have you on again. But I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, John. God bless you. And thank you, Sam. God bless both of you and all of your listeners. Thank you so much. And as we end each of our episodes, be a man, be a saint. <laughs>